Greetings again in Jesus' name. Uh, you can visit my website at standinagap.org. Download the PDFs and the big file up there called The Hoaxed. It covers almost all the deceptions that we constantly try to expose, and all the reformed errors. Or you can email me at my Holding Firmly account. And we discussed yesterday about doing searches for my videos. One person said if you type in Holding Firmly, which is my Gmail name, you'll get a better selection of my videos. If you just type that in all as one word and hit enter on, on a search on YouTube. So give that a try if you want to get a good selection of the videos. What I want to do here again is try to re-clarify again what it means to bring forth deeds worthy of repentance. What it means for man to have free and unhindered free will. It seems like almost everybody in and out of the system is confused about this. They've got this idea that God has to assist you in somehow before you'll even be able to believe or turn from, turn from your sins and even begin to seek Him. Because of this deception that's been preached for so long, for so long, over 1,500 and some years since 4th century Rome, since this came up, this idea of man's depravity or inability came up, this dual nature pagan nonsense, it's been infiltrated in our society so much that it's infected everything, almost everything, that's being preached. There's only a few people that I see on the internet that understand how to disseminate these false doctrines and how to show people what it means to have free and unhindered will to make a right choice in God. Because everybody says, you can't make a right choice. If I could do that, I could save myself. I, I, I wouldn't need Jesus. And, and all the rest of it. I have no ability to stop sinning. If I could stop sinning, then and all, and all these things. We hear the same excuses. We've been hearing them for a long time. But they just seem to be, even with people outside the system, that say they reject the lie of original sin, and all these false doctrines of the, of the uh, redemption, and penal substitution, and, and moral transfer, and all that stuff. But they still don't come forth with a clear and clarified message to people that it's up to them. Let's look at a few verses in the scriptures to preface this. In Proverbs 16.1 it says, The preparation of the heart belongs to man. This is the one thing that stumped even Mr. Augustine, old heretic Augustine, back in the 4th century when, when a, 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 a person that believed in free will, like the, like, the early, like the early Christians did, came to him and quoted this verse. The preparation of the heart belongs to man, Mr. Augustine, not to God. There's no election. There's no absolute this or absolute that. It's a choice. But the answer of the tongue is from God. Yeah. He initiates the call to repentance. You respond by your choice. That's why the Bible's written in such manner. Repent. Bring forth deeds worthy of repentance. He commands all men everywhere to repent. It doesn't say anything about man being unwilling or having inability or some dual nature that stops him from doing this. There's nothing discussed in the scriptures. That's Proverbs 16.1. The preparation of the heart belongs to man. In Proverbs, uh, in Chronicles 28.9, it talks about a willing heart. Look at Chronicles 28.9, and he's talking to Solomon. He says, he says to him, If you serve God with a loyal heart and a willing mind, for the Lord searches all hearts and understands all, all intent of the thoughts, and if you seek him, he will be found by you, but if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Just like Isaiah 59 says, It's your sins and your iniquity that have separated you from God, that has hidden his face from you. But see, under this deception, you people think that you're being blessed by God. People in the system. You know, they think that they have all the blessings and the trimmings and all that because of all the euphoria. So it's very difficult to reach them. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, the verse that they all read, I've heard many preachers read this verse of my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and they'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. I've heard that read many, many times, especially by the Pentecostal preachers in the past. But yet they don't believe it. That's the part here. 
what they believe, rather what they believe, they don't believe in free and unhindered free will and ability that man has a choice. He's only hindered in the fact that he's under deception in the system. He's under addictions to his sin that he doesn't want to break away from or confusion about what all this means because he's given himself so far into this deception. But like I said, they'll read those kind of verses, the preparation of the heart belongs to man. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, turn from their wicked ways, seek my face. What's so complicated about that? Why do you got to throw into the mix that all this stuff that they're not able to do that? Do you know what kind of damage is that's done to our society, to the world at large throughout the dark ages and the medieval times since 4th century Rome, the bloodshed and the horror that's brought down upon our heads in this present generation, all because somebody named Augustine, some heretic, comes up and says, I don't want to obey God. I got a problem with lust. So we'll come up with this dual nature thing. It says I don't have to. And they buy it in the Reformation. They buy it, hook, line, and sinker, write it in the Westminster Confession, and that's the end of it. They've adopted it since then. And they've been arguing in-house about doctrines and, and this and that and whether you should, this and that is true when the whole issue is repentance and faith proven by deeds. That's the central issue. So what do they do? They read these verses, like 2 Chronicles 7.14 or Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 28.9 or Proverbs 16.1 that clearly talks about the preparation of the willingness of man. See, Jesus said you're a slave to whom you obey, Right? Right, he told him, he says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And he tells, he tells in, in John chapter 8, and he tells the Pharisees that most assuredly I say to you, who commits sin is a slave to sin. Now, can't you even connect that? You people that are under this, he has to do it for you thing. Or he give you some kind of special ability. Can't you connect the fact that if you are a slave to whom you obey, that means you have the ability to obey. Can't you connect the two? See, just the very fact that he said this means that man has the ability either to submit himself to slavery of sin or to submit himself to obedience to God and do the right thing. So he can do the right thing. But you say, no, you can't do the right thing until you come to God. Right? You can't, is that right? The people in the search system, they, they think they've come to God and they still can't do the right thing. They're still wretched man, filthy rags, and all the rest of it. Now, what about you people outside the system? You say it almost the same thing. I see it in your emails and your posts all over your blogs. You say nearly the same thing. So what's that, what's that saying then? You're, tell, you're telling me that, that you don't have the free will to obey or not obey, either obedience unto righteousness or sin unto death, as Paul put it in Romans chapter 6. So which is it? You obeyed from your heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, having been set, you were, you were a slave to sin, but God be thanked that you obeyed from your heart. That's how that verse begins if you look at it in verse uh, 16 and 17. You were a slave to sin. You had sold yourself for nothing, like Isaiah says. You've sold yourself for nothing into sin to the slavery of sin, by your own choices that you made. But you obeyed from your heart. This is talking about people that came to their senses, like the par prodigal out of the pig pen. The father didn't come and pull him out of the pig pen. See, everybody talks about how the father ran out to greet him, but that's after he came to his senses and came out of the pig pen. You've got to come out of the pig pen before the father will run out and greet you or receive you. But see, nobody's telling anybody that. Because, well, you can't do that. You're hindered by uh, this limited ability. So, the simpleness of slavery to sin that can end in Christ by obedience to Him and His Word is all bundled up with this, He has to give you the ability. I, you know, I listed, all, I listed all the different things I keep seeing from, you, from the folks that say they don't believe in original sin like the system does. See, the original sin in the system hinders them from understanding anything. But those of you outside the system that are still got this thing totally complicated and confused, I see 
Well, yeah, that's right. But man, but God has to give him the ability to repent. See, unless I did, I don't I couldn't repent. I did I I couldn't stop sinning until God gave him the ability to repent, come do what's right. Or he has to make you willing. I hear a lot of street preachers saying that that he'll make you willing because they get into this theological nonsense that man's not willing to come to God. It's the willingness that that matters the most. But see, man's only unwilling to come to God in the sense that he's under deception or addicted to his sin, don't want to come to God because you do whatever you want to do. I can't make anybody do anything they do not want to do unless I coerce them, put a gun to their head or something like that, but that's not a, re that's not a real choice. That's a coerced choice. God doesn't do that. There's nowhere in the scriptures it shows that God had to offset somebody's inability to obey him. They simply obeyed him. Abraham, he obeyed God, right? Hebrews 11, 8. He obeyed God. It didn't say, oh, God, I don't know if I can obey you. Uh, uh, you might have to give me the ability to obey you. See, that's what you guys are saying. Don't you see how simple this is? He has to give you the ability. He has to make you willing. He has to offset your depravity. That's theology. What depravity? What, well, he's not... He doesn't have a sin nature from Adam, but he has this, uh, this, this depraved nature in his flesh. Flesh is flesh, folks. It's sarks. Flesh, it covers the bones. There's nothing magic about it. So he, there's, sin can't dwell in your flesh means the passions and desires of the flesh. Man's created what? Yes or toe, yes or raw in the, in the Hebrew, meaning with moral conscience and natural choices. His natural choices are not sinful until he subjects them to sin like James talks about. You sin when you subject your desires to, you're enticed and then you, you give in to that. Then your desire and your willingness unite and then it becomes a sin unto death. So he has to offset your depravity. He has to make the choice for you. That's the, the ultimate deception. You're either elected or not. And, and, then they, and then they get into the, the alternatives to repentance. Repentance alone is not enough. We have to have some moral government thing, some, some alternative appeasement that Jesus did on the cross, uh, some, some substitution that took place that, that, that uh, appeases God. We've, we've talked about it in many of my other lessons. But see, all of those are what? They're, they're alternatives to repentance to the obedience that you should have given to God to begin with. Because why? The preparation of the heart belongs to you. What's the heart? The mind. The f unhindered free will and ability, the choice that you have to come to God. People write to me and ask me, well, what are the deeds of repentance? Well, what do I do? How do I love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength? Foolishness. I mean, that's like asking me, how do I love my wife with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength? I mean, can't you reason through that? Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Can't you reason that if you want to love your spouse with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then you, you do everything you can in the world to please them and do nothing to displease them. Isn't that all that God's saying? What did he say? What must I do to inherit eternal life, Master? You love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Your neighbor is yourself. On that hangs all the law and the prophets. Why is that not the gospel? But it's so confused. I can understand why people's confused. You know, I, I, I would have to say the same thing. I, can't, I, I was never confused by all these doctrines until I got subjected to them, to some of them. But repentance, I didn't know it was a doctrine that there were various doctrines of repentance when I first repented, read the word, understood that God wanted me to come clean with them, and did, we did so through the Spirit and came to, came to a, a repentance and faith in enlightenment of the Spirit. I didn't understand that there was all these doctrines connected to it and theology connected to it. But see, that again, that's, that's, no, conf that's no excuse for any of us to not do what we're supposed to do to begin with. That's all I'm saying here. So, why inject the spirit of error constantly 
with statements like he has to give you the ability. He has to make you willing. Where does it say that in the scriptures? I know you can prove anything in the scriptures you want to prove. You can prove the sky is pink or the, the moon's going to be covered with blood. But come on. Where does it say in the scriptures anywhere when Jesus confronted someone or one of the prophets confronted someone that they lacked the ability to do what was right? Isaiah told him, learn to do good. Wash your hands. Learn to do good. Cleanse yourself of all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Over and over again. And then we'll still hear people outside the system saying, man can't cleanse himself. We're talking about a self-cleansing humility where you're a departure from sin. Back to 2 Chronicles 7.14, right? If my people call by my name, will humble themselves, depart from their wicked ways, in other words, just like James says, just like James in 1, 21 and 22, all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Cleanse yourself of those things. And then come with meekness, meekness of repentance, not pride that I did something in the sight of God. No, you're obeying God. See, your duty is to obey God. That's all the scriptures are trying to say. When he says, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance, man has the responsibility given to him to make that right choice and to do so. The reason it's not easy is because of coming out from under layers and layers of deception. Like I said, God initiates the call, right? He sends forth the call. I, all men, I command all men everywhere to repent. In the book of Acts, Acts 17, right, verse 30, 31, where Paul's preaching to the Greeks. And to prove their repentance by their deeds, as he told them again in Acts 26. Okay, he initiates that call. His hand is outstretched. Three times in the, in the scriptures. It talks about it in uh, Proverbs chapter 1 and Isaiah two times. Isaiah 59, and again, again I'd, I'd have to take a look. But he's talking about he stretches his hand out all day long. He's not willing any should perish. The Holy Spirit's convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. His part is being done for anyone that seeks his face. So in that process, certainly the Spirit's leading you through the process. But what we're saying here is that the end product of being filled with the Spirit, purged and cleansed, a saint in God's eyes, not, not a wretched man sinner like the church is coming up with, happens after you've made that choice to break from your sinful ways. Your vile sins we're talking about. We're talking about sins that will, will disqualify you from the kingdom. You know what those sins are. Not the, There's all kinds of little things you might have or things you've got to get rid of in your house or stuff you bought in the past you want to sell and give the money to the poor and all that kind of thing. Now, we're talking about adultery and fornication and drunkenness and drug addiction and pornography and all the rest of it. Those kind of things. That's what you depart from in repentance. Or you're never going to stop doing them, just like the people in the church. Do they ever stop doing those things? They keep saying, well, well with Jesus, then we can stop. Well, they mean they're a work in progress, and they'll, of course, it, it never takes place. See, in the scriptures, we're told that we should obey God. Love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? Matthew 22. So it means we have the ability to do so. I didn't see anybody in those scriptures telling God, well, okay, God, when, when God gives me the ability to love you with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, well, then I'll do it. No, they either did or they didn't. They had a choice. See, man's duty is to obey God because he has called all men everywhere to repentance. That's his initial call. Your response is to either obey or disobey. But the gospel's not being preached that way for a long, long time. And that's the layers of deception that we constantly have to unravel. And if you think you can come into the faith through some miraculous repentance, and then not be aware of all these deceptions and keep associating with the spirit of error and quoting the old reformers and all that other stuff and the people today that believe in moral depravity and, and moral transfer and all that stuff because they're saying good things about not sinning. 
Remember, everything they say is underscored with inability. Remember that. God's got to make them able. So they were saved in their sins, not out of them. All right? You've got to get that in your head. See, a person is never going to stop sinning unless it happens in this process of repentance. It ain't going to happen in the churches. It's not happening. It's not even an issue. So why even say that, that uh, well, people stop sinning all the time and that's just religion, religion and, and that's hypocrisy. They're not really clean on the inside. Give me a break. Where's that happening? I don't see that. Ha I see people glorying in their sins under that false system, system of error we keep talking about. I don't see anybody that's, that went to the promise keepers and all that stuff that have actually departed from doing, doing their sins. So why even throw that into the mix to confuse and complicate the issue even more? See, I don't get it. I don't get the statements people keep making that are supposed to be enlightened and led by the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit going to lead you anywhere or anything that's contrary to this, to the Word of God? And you've got to dig deep into the Word of God. You say, well, I'll wait until I hear from the Spirit. The Spirit's going to confirm what's in here. If it doesn't, it's not the Spirit of God. It's another Spirit. I don't care how close it mimics or how much it looks like. Remember, they can appear as ministers of righteousness, it says in 2 Corinthians 11. They can cloak themselves and take a form. So whatever form pleases you is be the form that they're going to appear to you if you're not deep into this Word. Remember, Jesus is the Word, right? Jesus is the Word. He's the Logos. Logos, that means Word. The Word was with God, right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So without that, we have nothing to confirm the false spirits that John told us to be warned about. Like in 1 John 4, not every spirit is from God. Not every spirit that you think you're hearing from in your, your mind is from God. Many false prophets have gone out into the world, John says. Many, multitudes in our generation. And they're leading people into all these different paths of error. And that's what disturbs me the most, especially the divided camps of the people that are outside the system and should be contending against this and not, not complicating the issue even further. I mean, we try to clarify this as best we can. But it seems there's still people under the confusion and even will cast dispersions and say, well, that's just doctrine. That's just uh, uh, arguing about doctrine. What, what are you talking about? Doctrine is teaching. That's all it is. Doctrine's not theology. Jesus didn't come to teach systematic theology. That came out of the minds of men in the Reformation. He came to teach us the way to eternal life, which is to strive to enter by the narrow gate, to love Him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to take up our cross, to count the cost, to put our hand to the plow, and all the rest of it. That's what he came to teach. That's his doctrine, his sound words. J John said in 2 John 7 through 11, he said, if anybody comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, what's he talking about? The teachings, the word, the logos. Don't receive him. Don't greet him. Don't welcome him and don't wish him Godspeed or God bless, it means there. Because if you do that, you're partaking in his sin. So when you're toying with the reformers and you're thinking that, well, Finney says some good stuff and Wesley says some good stuff. Yes, they did. They did. But bottom line, they were in great error on the basics of free will and ability. So that's the reason, that's what necessitated the reams of doctrine, systematic theology that they came up with. And people have been debating it ever since. Those things we don't want to debate. We just cast down the strongholds. But to tell me that, that we're talking doctrine when we say you've got to properly understand the redemption, you've got to properly understand what repentance and faith proven by deeds is, is the same thing, you're in great error. What do you mean you've got to hear from the Spirit before? It's in here, okay? It's all in the Scriptures. If you just study to show yourself approved, if you go with the faithful word, 
to convict and, and rebuke those who contradict. How are we going to do that if we don't have the Word of God written in the Scriptures? I just, I, again, see the very fact that the Bible tells us that a person can be a slave to whom they'll obey confirms free will, just like the parable of the sower, as many things I've pointed out in the past, like the, the prodigal son, he got up out of the pig pen on his own, he came to himself, it says, he in, rose up and went to the Father. Free will, ability to do so. God didn't have to enable him, he didn't have to offset his free will, he didn't have to make him willing, none of that happened. And it's the same thing, it's the same thing in the rest of the scripture. Zacchaeus, when he repented, he made amends for his 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 crookedness of, as a tax collector, and then came to present himself to Jesus. And Jesus said, salvation of today has come to your house. Can't you see? I know you can produce scriptures and say, oh, this guy got saved in his sins, and this guy got... It's all error, okay? It's all theology. It's not what the scriptures teach. Just like the prophet Isaiah said, your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins has hidden his face from you. Isaiah 59.2. See, from the very beginning, God said, you should rule over it. When he said to Cain, when he went to slay his brother, you should rule over it in Genesis 4, 7. Read that. Rule over what? You rule over your desire to go take revenge on your brother because his deeds were righteous and yours wicked, and God accepted his sacrifice because it was of more excellent sacrifice, as Hebrews 11 talks about, and to kill him for that. You rule over it. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not well, sin lies at the door. Its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. That's what that passage says. It should blow away all of this inability. All of this. But it, it still just doesn't register with, with folks. They say you can't rule over it until God intervenes in some manner and some supernatural ability comes within you so that you can rule over it. So you can repent. Well, the supernatural ability, maybe do you mean just the Spirit of God convicts you of sin? He's not indwelling you, He's convicting you. Maybe, maybe that. Maybe it's just a matter of semantics. But the way you state these things, when you say things like He has to give you the ability, it's a red flag. That's not what the scriptures teach. Certainly he works through the repentance process. Just like David, when he went through, look how long he went through his repentance. I know the church looks at that like, you know, he just got forgiven in all his iniquity. But no, he went through nine months, probably a year of darkness and misery in his repentance. If you read them Psalm, Psalm 32 and 51 properly. What's well, the same thing here? Was the Spirit leading him through that? Well, in a sense, the Spirit was convicting his heart to come clean with God, but that mercy was not granted until his heart was emptied of guile. And there was no alternative, ulterior motive like Saul, where Saul comes in, in like a Second Samuel there where he gets rejected because he wanted to offer sacrifices to God and Saul, Samuel told him to obey is better than sacrifice. To heed to God rather than, than to sacrifice all these bulls and lambs. It's of no value, in other words. You want to obey from your heart, from the very center of your being. God doesn't have to give you some supernatural ability so that you can receive Him and then this cleanup can start. No, the cleanup happens in repentance or it ain't never going to happen. Do you grow in grace after that? Do you, f other things in your life, the, but not fornication and drunkenness and uncleanness and vileness? No, those things were gone. They're cast out of doors. Certainly we all grow in grace. We all grow in Christ, more Christ-like, more closer to God. Certainly. But what happens in repentance is that stuff, that stuff that's going to disqualify you from the kingdom, if you went back to your vomit, that stuff's done away with. The body of sin is dead. It's done away with, like Romans 6 talks about. So, if God... See, these people... What happens with, with a lot of people is, see, they, re, they, 
They come to Jesus and they ask for this supernatural ability to give them the ability to repent, receive Jesus, and then the cleanup can start. And when that doesn't happen, since God's waiting for them to prepare their heart and come stop sinning, come clean, so, after, so that doesn't happen after a period of time, they accept then the work in progress excuse, and then they learn to maintain that sin repent, sin repent relationship, like a lot of people on these blogs that aren't rebuked for their false teachings. So then they have a pseudo relationship, still waiting for this mysterious intervention to take place and magically remove their overwhelming desires and cravings to go back to their, their vomit, which they do in a pattern of repeated failure. Well, that's the system. But why take part in those things by telling people about lack of ability? He has to make you willing. He has to offset something inside you. And then giving them alternatives to repentance, as we've covered before. See, you're not preaching the gospel. Man has unhindered free will inability to make the right choice and come to God. He can indeed make right choices before he comes to God and then get into the process that's going to bring him to salvation. If he can't make a right choice, how can anything be done right in our society? How could anybody, how could any fireman or police officer or soldier ever do what was right and save other people's lives? You see how much of a fallacy this thing is? How it's created this fog in the people's minds that they can't seem to see through this deception? So they think that they didn't have the ability and God had to magically give it to them. No, you made the choice to seek God. That's what happened. When you made that choice, like 2 Chronicles 7.14 again, the preparation of the heart belongs to man. God tests your heart. What did that scripture say? There he, he, he tests your heart the, back in uh, 1 Chronicles 28. He says, if you're willing, you have a loyal and willing heart, God, the Lord searches the heart, understands all intent of the thoughts. See, if you seek him, he understands every thought and intent of the heart. Not everybody's heart is desperately wicked, like Jeremiah 17 was talking about. The same thing here. God tests the heart in the mind, rewards each one according to the to fruit of his doings. That's the key in repentance here. And that's the key in understanding how to present this to people that are out there seeking to understand what it means to come out of this deception. Tell them. Don't be afraid to tell them they've got to bring forth deeds. Don't be afraid to tell them they have the strength to obey God. It sets them free from the deception. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've experienced it just now, on the, just this afternoon with a person. And he said, thank God, thank God. I mean, I answered the simple question, what, do, what does it mean to love your wife with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? See, because of the deception, the fog, he wasn't getting through. Like they, they used to, what, say thick-headedness or bullheadedness when we were in school? The same thing's going on here. So give him the simple answer. Don't jumble it up with he has to give you the ability. He has to make you willing. That's theology. The scriptures don't teach that. Just get back to the simple message of the scripture. That pre preparation of the heart belongs to man. The answer of the tongue is from God. He initiated the call. You have to prepare your heart. How are you going to do that? In repentance. With deeds to prove that you've repented. Just like you'd prove to anybody that you've done wrong. Anybody that you've hurt in this life. Or your spouse that you've hurt. What would you do if you wanted to come back to your spouse after you cheated on him? What would you do? That's the same thing we're talking about here. You would do anything. If you truly wanted to re restore that relationship and reconcile it, you would crawl on your face, on your belly. You'd make any am amends or preparations that you had to do to cut off your old thing and, and show your sorrow through the choices and the deeds that you're making. That's the same thing with God. Why would God be any different? Why does He got to forgive you in your sins? And then, and then you can repent or get cleaned up or something. No, it's the same. It, it's so simple. You should rule over it. You can prepare your heart. You have the ability to choose. All that's stopping you 
is your sin, addiction to your sin, the confusion and deception that you've been under, and your own unwillingness to do what's right to begin with. You make the right choice, and God's going to meet you in that process of repentance, and you will come clean and be cleansed and filled with His Holy Spirit. But if you don't, and you come up with this mess, you're going to get some false spirit that's going to lead you astray into some path of error that I've seen a hundred times before. And you're going to go down the path of the error of the wicked, like Peter said. And that's a dark and dark and ruinous place to be. There's only one path, and that's the narrow way to strive to enter through that narrow gate. Come on, let's all agree that man has the ability to do what's right. To come clean with God and make a right choice in repentance and go through that process of broken humility to find final forgiveness in Him. Let's find agreement and accord in that and bring people in this world out of this mess that are seeking. That's what I ask.